Hey there, robot makers. Do you want to learn about pandas and get started in data science with Python? Then this is the show for you. Uh, let's dive straight in. My name is Kevin. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote. Oops, that's not my keynote. That's an orange or something. Is that a clementine? I don't know. Tangerine. Anyway, let's get over to our pandas uh, tutorial, shall we? So the session today is about learning the basics of pandas uh, to do some basic operations and to do something quite cool with some data that I've downloaded from YouTube, which is all the videos I publish today. I want to make a nice um, GitHub-like contribution chart that we can stick on the website. So we're going to do that using some pandas today. So we're going to learn about what it is, um, what Python sorry what pandas and numpy is we're going to do some live coding with pandas as well lots of live coding today learn how to install pandas we're actually going to install it uh, live on the show today uh, we're going to learn about some data frames what they are what why we use them for do some basic operations adding deleting data and columns and so on we'll do some filtering of data some data manipulation importing and exporting from some popular file formats such as excel csv yaml and we'll do some data visualization using matplotlib and some seaborn for some heat maps and if you're here for the live stream we'll have a bit of a q a uh, mailbox as well after the show so okay let's get into it shall we so what is pandas <laughs> so some people were saying about the uh, the thumbnail being a bit confusing there um is it really that confusing, Adam? I don't know. I don't know what you expected to see in this show. Some kind of giant robot panda. So Pandas is an open source data analysis and manipulation tool. It's built on top of Python, um, a Python programming language, and it's written in C and behind the scenes. So it's actually very, very fast at doing data manipulation within Python. It's ideal for working with data structures like tables, time series data, matrices, and so on. Like I said, it's very, very fast. I think there's even a version of pandas for or numpy i should say numpy we'll get onto in a second um for micropython which is pretty cool so if you've used excel or power bi from microsoft you might have come across power query and pandas is similar to what you can do with power query uh, however it's a programming language of itself so um it means that we can do a lot more things than you can probably do in, in Power Query. So Excel Power Query is like a graphical user interface. You can sort of drag things around and, and whatnot. It's, it's suitable sort of quick and simple kind of transformations. You can do some more complex ones in there, but it gets pretty pretty crazy pretty quickly because you can't do things like functions very easily within that. So Pandas, on the other hand, is Python library, and that requires some coding skills. And while it offers some flexibility over, say, Power Query, it has a bit of a learning curve to it as well. So Pandas is known for its speed and efficiency, particularly when handling very, very large data sets. So it's used a lot in academia, a lot in uh, data science. Uh, so it's something you probably want to learn. And compatibility wise, comparing it to say Excel, Excel Power Query is closely integrated with Microsoft Excel and therefore only works on Windows. I think some of it may work on the Macintosh platform, but it certainly doesn't work on Linux or anywhere else. Pandas works anywhere that you can run Python pretty much. So. Um, whole wide range of operating systems it's very flexible and extensible so you can add to it you can um, expand it and do all kinds of clever stuff with particular extra functions and so on so that's a bit of an overview just a bit of a comparison so one of the main things we need to look at in uh, pandas is data frames so data frame in pandas is a two-dimensional array it says it's size mutable with potentially heterogeneous um, tabular data structures with label axes. What that actually means is once you make a data frame, you can't change the size of it. You can add data to it, but you essentially do that by creating a new copy of it uh, with the, the new columns or new rows added to it. Um, and the, um, the heterogeneous tabular data structure just means that we can have different types of data within the cells. It doesn't have to all be integers and um, strings and so on in the same column you can actually mi mix and match it you probably wouldn't want to do that because if you're querying data typically you want it all to be in the same format and it's akin to like a spreadsheet that's the probably the easiest way to picture this in your mind it's a table or an SQL table uh, and they're most commonly used with uh, pandas projects uh, as a pandas object so a data frame axis is the, the horizontal or vertical lines that you can draw through the, uh, the table. And these represent typically the, the rows and the columns. So the horizontal um, axis is called the index and the vertical axis is the columns. So we just need to call that out there. So the series is 
essentially columns of data, one dimensional labeled arrays, as it calls it. So the columns of data uh, and they typically hold data like in integers, strings, floats and so on. But you can even have full objects in there. It doesn't matter. Now, for efficiency, you probably do want to tell Python what kind of co uh, data is in each column and therefore it can use less memory if it's just uh, an object it will use a lot more memory and that becomes more significant the larger the data set that you're working on but for what we're doing today we don't need to get into any sort of complexity with that so series are the, the building blocks of frames so rows are kind of self-explanatory they're kind of um, groups of related data i should say so for example we've got some movie data on here got all the different robots from different films and the release date of those films and one of the rows we've selected there is how 9000 from 2001 which was released in 1968 so each row is assigned a unique index number so you can see that very first column has got zero one two three four uh, and that means that we can individually represent uh, each column we can we can locate it and then work on that particular row of data just by using that index and the index is added automatically when we create our data frame so why do we want to use data frames well it's tabular data like spreadsheets so it means if we're working with data that's come from spreadsheets very very easy to work with um, the efficiency of handling the data i'm just going to turn down those notifications a bit there uh, so we can filter data we can aggregate it together and do pivot charts and things like that very very simply uh, with tabular data in a data frame um, the performance optimized, so very suitable for large data um, sets in memory, so we can do some very, very fast operations because it's all in memory, but that means we do have to treat our, uh, our data frames carefully to make sure that we don't just overload it with um, all kinds of stuff in there, particularly when making duplicates of the data. And the, the built-in data analysis means we can do simple statistical operations and groupings very, very quickly, very, very easily. And it works with all kinds of data sources and formats. So we'll see that when we do some importing and exporting uh, in a second. And we can easily visualize the data as well. So Pandas is often used very closely with NumPy, which is the um, Python numeric library. We can do sort of very simple things with that very quickly. And Matplotlib, which is the... I hope I pronounced that right. That's the visualization library that often gets um, bundled together with Pandas for visualizing data. We'll do some of that uh, in the demo shortly. And it's user friendly, so there's lots of accessible syntax um, for data tasks. So it's very, very easy to, to work with it because it's kind of as you expect it to be when you write the code. So let's get straight into it, shall we? So I've got, um, I've got something ready to go here. Let me just load up. Uh, we can either do this in Jupyter Notebook or we can do this in Visual Studio. So I might switch and between the two of them as we go. So first of all, I've gone over to collab.research.google.com and I've just created a, a new, uh, new notebook. So these notebooks allow us to write code and also put text within that code and then work on our data kind of interactively. So what we'll do first of all is we will we'll look at how we actually install um, Panda. So for that, I'm actually going to switch over to, um, let me just clear my screen there. We're actually going to go over to a virtual environment that I've just created. Um, so if you want to know how to create a virtual environment, you would do Python, um, Python 3 dash M and then VENV. And I typically do VENV as well for the, the virtual environment. And that will create a virtual environment. And then you would typically then do source virtual environment, the binary folder, and then you type activate. Uh, and that would activate the virtual environment. That's what I've done here. You can see it says VMV in brackets. So if I now do pip install pandas, we can see it um, check the installation of pandas. It says we're already um, up to date and in, in, uh, got all the re requirements installed and satisfied already. So pandas numpy and so on. So if I just switch back to, um, I just got to be joining the channel there. Thank you for that. I shall just uh, turn off those for a second okay so if we want to check that we've got um, pandas installed I think we do pip install pandas if you're in uh, Google Colab if I just do that it'll just check that it's actually installed uh, you can see yeah it's already installed so that's fine so you just do that exclamation mark pip install pandas for that so what's cool about this is we can add these different blocks of code and we can change things and we can uh, work on our data as we go so now that we've installed pandas we're going to do um, we are going to look at um, NumPy. So let's do pip install NumPy as well. So NumPy is the Python uh, number number library, numeric library. And it allows us to do some pretty cool things 
with that. So while that's just uh, checking that's installed, which it is, we can now import NumPy as NP. And this is a very common um, best practice when you're working with things like NumPy and Pandas. You import it and then you actually give it a name. So instead of having to type NumPy every time, you can just do NP. So if we want to create a new array, let's do array equals uh, and do NumPy. So np.array and then we can just give it um, one, two, three, four, five, something like that. If we now just type array like that at the bottom, it will actually output what's in that array. So it works very, very similar this um, as a regular kind of um, array or list dictionary, that kind of thing in Python. But we can also do things like um, sum. So we type in sum and we just rerun this. In fact, we could actually put that sum in a separate code block. So we don't have to keep importing it all the time. So if we now just rerun that, we'll see that we get 15. And say we want to look at the um, max instead. So what's the maximum value in that array? We can just do max. And it should be five. And we can also do min, like so. And it's just going to find the minimum value in that array. And we can also look at what the shape of that array is. So currently, this is a one dimensional array. So we do array shape. It will tell us that it's, uh, it's got five items in the array and it doesn't have any other dimensions to it. It's just a single um, shape. So that's how we work with um, NumPy. And we'll use NumPy occasionally when we're doing stuff in data uh, in pandas. So what we'll do now is we'll import pandas as PD. That's the usual way of working with this. And we're gonna create some movie data. So movie robots. So let's... Uh, Oops. Now I might I might do this bit actually in thinking maybe no no let's do let's do it all in the same thing right so let's start working on this so we're going to say Robbie the robot so he's from Forbidden Planet and that film was released in 1956. Now we're now going to have another one, which is the Gunslinger. And that's from which movie? From Westworld. And that was released in 1973. Great film. Next up, we're going to have HAL 9000. And oops. And HAL 9000 is from the film 2001, which isn't a number, it's a title. And that was released in 1968. And then let's have... Uh, another one which is Maria which is from the movie Metropolis and that was released a very long time ago nearly a hundred years ago 1927 and then let's have one last one which is Johnny Five Johnny Five and that was from the film Short Circuit and that was released in 1986 there we go. Okay, so if we just like, if we just output movie robots now and just see what happens when we do that. Oops, what's gone wrong there? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, there's a indentation it didn't like there. There we go. So what we've got there is just um, an array of data. So what we want to do is we actually want to put that into um, a data frame. So if we say data frame equals PD for pandas, data frame, and then we pass in movie robots. And then let's look what's in data frame when we do that. It looks very different. And in fact, Jupyter Labs detects this as a table. So we've got some, some indexes. On the top there, we've got 0, 1, 2. And then down the side, we've got 1 to 4. That is 0 to 4. We've got five different entries. So it'd be great if those had a column headings. So let's create some headings, shall we? So let's say headings equals, and then, um, so robot. Then we'll have movie. And then we'll have release year. And now we can add those columns. We can either do it over here just by saying column, columns equals headings. I just need to move the uh, location of this so that that is just above it. Like so. And now let's just run this code and see what happens now. So now we've got nice headings of our data frames. You can see there, robot movie release year. Cool. 
so let's have a look let's now type in shape to see what happens now so remember when we ran it before on the other code it simply just had one uh, just five to say there's five items um, well now we've got five items um, five rows and we have three columns so the five three means what five five rows and three columns cool so let's do some other operations on this now that we uh, we've got some data loaded we can typically when you've got a very large data set so maybe we just need to create um, We'll, we'll, we'll create some other more data in, in a different way in a minute. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll print out the data frame head. So if you've ever used a Unix before, you can actually just give you the head of the file um, and it'll just list the first, I've said, give me the first three items. So it's gone 0, 1, 2 as the first three items. We can also do the opposite of that. So we could do print the last three items. So can you guess what that would be? Oops, called tail. So let's get the last three items from that data frame. And there you go, two, three, four as the last three items in the data frame, just as we've entered it in there. Cool. And we can, if we want to, we can change that to be like the last two, or you could say the last 10, even though we've only got five items in it, and it'll, it'll work the way you expect it to. And you can see how quick it is at doing that as well. It's very, very, very fast. Cool. So next up, we want to select some data. So if we want to select, say, um, a list, uh, a column of data, uh, we can do that. So we can say, um, uh, let's just do a comment there, a list of, a uh, list of column, like so. And then we can do print our data frame. And then we pass in the name of the column that we want to uh, look at. So I'm just going to say movie. So if I run that, it's just going to give me the movie column. So that's pretty quick. Also gives you that other bit of information there. So it says the name of that column is movie and the type of that column is object. So we've not optimized it to be a string or anything like that. But that's fine for now for what we're working with. Now that's great for columns. If we want to do to a select a row, we can do this by doing print and then df and then, sorry, dot index location I lock of say one. So let's run this. And it's going to give us Westworld because that's the the index value one that's in there. So if we change that to index value four, for example, it should give us a short circuit. There you go. Works just the way you would expect it to. So that's how we can select some rows. Now we want, we might want to add some data to um, our our data frame. So we'll we'll create some new data. We'll say data equals, and then let's just do um, a whole new set of data on here. So let's say. Uh, this is going to be, um, this is a, a list, isn't it? So let's um, let's put in here name. And the name is going to have three items in it. It's going to have Alice, it's going to have Bob, and it's going to have Charlie. Okay, and then we're going to have, um, the next one is going to be age. And this is going to have the ages of, Alice, Bob and Charlie, so let's just go for that. And then we're going to have the city that they live in. So let's just do um, New York. Let's do Paris. Let's do London. Oops, what is going on there? Okay, so that's our data. And we can now create a new data frame. Let's call it DF1. And we'll make that equal to um, a pandas data frame. And we'll just pass in the data. So if we now print out df1, let's have a look uh, what's going on there. Let's see if we get our data into those nice columns as, as you've seen with the uh, the movie ones there. And now what we want to do is we want to add a new column to this. So let's go and do that now. Let's uh, create a new block. So we're going to create a new column. So we can do this just by going straight into the data frame. So df1. And we're going to create a new column that we're going to call salary. So we've not had to do anything else other than, other than this. So we can say 70,000, uh, 80,000. Notice how you can do an underscore in Python as well to separate out um, digits. So you can see this is 70,000, 80,000, 90,000. And you can very quickly see that. Whereas if it was if it was like that, you wouldn't know without quickly looking at it how many um what, you know what the actual value of that is there so we can we can do that just by putting this underscore in there it doesn't actually change the value of the number at all it's just, just for our um, leg legibility okay so let's do that and let's just print out df1 let's see what happens now 
So we've now got an extra column on there. We've now got salary being added to that. And it's added it, um, so Alice was the first one, Bob is the second, and Charlie is the third. So that's the way that it's added that slice of data to it. And we can even delete columns as well very, very simply. So if you just go over to here, and we want to create, um, let's do del df uh, one, and then just let's get rid of the age column, for example. Uh, we can do that, and then let's just print out df1. And if we do that, we've got rid of that age column. So very, very quick and very, very simple to do these things and they kind of work the way you would expect them to work. OK, so we might want to replace some data. Let's do some replacing of data next. So let's go in here and let's change. Let's give everybody a pay rise so we can see DF1 and then salary. And what we're going to do now is we're going to make the salaries 75,000, 85,000 and 95,000 like so let's run that and let's just do df1 so we can see what's in it and you can see that we've now given everybody a salary rise 75 70, 85 and 90 so if you wanted to change that this is why i like um, these jupyter notebooks if we go back to where we actually put that data in there so say i change that to 90,001 for example i can just rerun that cell i can then rerun the next cell and then rerun the, oops, rerun the next after we've already got rid of age so obviously that's not going to work there uh, and then we can rerun that one there too so um, I actually changed it again there didn't but yeah you can just see how quickly you can just rerun these cells just by hitting that little run button and it means you don't have to run the entire code you can just rerun the last time you change that cell which is quite nice cool so that's how we would change um, a value um, now, sometimes you, you want to replace values um, kind of en masse. So let's do that on here. So we can use the replace function. So we, we would say df salary. And we can actually just replace the whole lot by saying df salary. So it's df1, isn't it? Our data frame salary. And then we can do dot replace. And we can replace any of the values, so say 75,000, and let's also change that to 76,000, like that. So we can change values by just specifying the value that we want to replace uh, with the value that we want to replace it with. So you can see there we've now got 76,000, 85, 95,001. Okay, so that's that one done. So next up, we want to select some columns. So let's go and do that. It's very similar to what we did before when we looked at the, the movie column. So let's do um, selected column, let's create a new variable. And we make that equal to uh, the salary column, for example. And then if we, oops, we then just print out what's in selected column. There we go, yep, that's what I want. We'll see that we just get that column and we can see there the name of it is salary but we just get the raw data back we always get that index back because that's an internal part of data frames and it just means that we can con continue to do things on that data frame like selecting individual rows if we want to by the row location so that's how we would select a column we can select multiple columns if we want to so we go back there and let's do um, selected columns um, so this is going to be df1 and we're going to do, um, let's do name, and we've got rid of age, but let's go back in there and just run this. So it's going to complain that we haven't got the age because we actually got rid of it. But what we can go back up here and do is we can rerun that where we originally put in that data, and we can skip out the, the part where we delete the age. So this is why this is quite neat. And then we can basically just rerun everything up to that point. So there we go. Oops, did I type something wrong there? So I think I just needed to, uh, just need to do that. Okay, let's rerun that one again, sorry. And um, what am I doing wrong there? So I think it's not that, it's comma. There we go. And then we just need to do, just to print out selected columns to see what's in that value. And it should just select the two columns, the name and the age. So this means it's very easy to sort of 
get rid of all the other data that you don't need and just sort of zoom into the data that you do need. Now we still have DF1 there, so we can still, if we just do DF1, we can still see that that original set of data is has, as we last left it. So selected columns is just a new variable that we've created just for the selected column data. Cool, so that's how we do that. Now if we want to select by rows, let's do that next. So we can say uh, rows by position and we can say df1 dot and let's do um, sorry dot i location so the index location and we can say give me everything from index location 0 to index location 5 so it'll just give me the first five rows we just need an equals in there as well and then let's just print out what's in rows by position so it looks exactly the same as the original one, but what we've said in there is just give me that. So if I said give me, I don't know, two to four, rerun that, we'll just get two to four. So what's going on there? That's that's because I'm specifying the the number of columns and the number of um, yeah. So if I do zero five, that's just give me everything, all five columns. If I do four, it's going to going to miss out some of the data let's try three and then two and then one cool we've only got three rows of data so give me the first five we've only got three rows of data anyway to do that so we could actually change that to be our movies if we wanted to and see what that looks like with more data but you get the idea there we can specify um, by a range so using that colon between it specifies the range there so let's go and do just a single row then so um, row by index we can then do the same thing so let's do our dot location so instead of I location we we'll just do um, lock and we can say location zero and let's just print out our rows by index just run that and see what happens so you can see there we've just got um, Alice that's the row that we've selected which is just this row zero because that's the location we selected and it's got a name age a city and a salary and we can see there that the name is a zero because that's the the name of that particular row uh, which is an index value and then the type is an object because it's got all those different values in it so that's how we do it by index okay so let's filter some data next so next we want to filter some data. So let's do filtered data equals df1, df1 salary. And we're going to specify a range where the salary is greater than 77,000, for example. And then let's print out what's in the filtered data. Now I'm not doing the word print on here, I can just type in that and because we're in Jupyter Notebooks it knows to actually print out and it prints it in this nice format here where you can actually you can actually say give me a graph as well if you wanted to see that. Or you can just see the, uh, it's actually going to do all kinds of other interesting graphs there or you can basically just say uh, rerun that, just give me as a table. So there we go, so anything that's over 77,000, so it's just brought back Bob and Charlie because their salaries are over 77,000. Um, so you can see how that works. If we change that to be over 90,000, we should just get that one row back. And if we made that over 70,000, we should get all three back because everybody's over that. So that's how we can do some basic filtering on there. Now, we might want to sort our data as well. This is a thing you would typically do in a spreadsheet. So this works pretty much as you would expect. So sorted data equals data frame dot sort. And then we just need to say what the values that we're we're uh, um, we want to sort by. So let's sort by city. So by equals city. So which one should come first? Um, is it London, New York, and Paris? So let me just make sure I've got that right. That I switched up in brackets. Sorry, not uh, square brackets. There we go. Let's run that. And what have I done wrong there? Let me just quickly check my code. So df one sort values by equals city. Sort values with an S. There we go. Let's 
bit of a typo and then we can just print out sorted values sorry sorted data and let's see what's in that sorted data so London, New York and Paris. So that's an alphabetical order. That's the, the ordering that it's done there. Now we might want to do this um, in the kind of reverse um, order. So we can actually specify ascending. Can I spell that right? Ascending equals. And then you can say false. Let's run that. So Paris, New York and London. So it's kind of in a reverse. Or you could have that as true to have it in the ascending order as we had it originally, which was the default. So there we go. So that's how we do some basic sorting. Now we can also do some computation on here as well. Um, so let's compute some values. We might want to work out what our salary, if we at the employer, we want to know what we need to pay everybody and have in the bank. So we could say, let's get some mean values first of all. So let's just get the salary. And we're gonna do the mean value of that. And this is where the uh, the numpy behind the scenes can help us with this. So if we now just print out mean value, let's see what happens there. So the mean value of all those values is 85333.66 reoccurring. We could do a sum. So let's do sum value equals df1 dot, sorry, uh, salary dot sum. And then let's just print out the sum value. There we go. So 25, what's that? 256,001. That sounds about right. Our one there from the 95,001. And we might actually want to drop some columns and data. So we've seen that before where we, we've, um, we've filtered it, but we can actually drop columns similar to how you would drop something in... Um, in SQL so let's do this so let's do df dropped rows and we can say df1 dot drop and we can say which things to drop so 0 1 and 2 that's going to basically drop everything so let's just do df dropped to see what's in the dropped rows so you can see we've got no row data but it has kept the column headers because that frame of data is that's still there to hold data there's just no data in it so that's an interesting thing to understand there um, and we can drop columns as well so we haven't got rid of our original um, data frame that's df1 still there with all our data in so we can still do things with that so if we now do df dropped columns and that equals df1 dot drop and let's tell it the columns that we want to drop. So just salary and say city. So it should re should keep the name and the age of the person. And we also have to specify when we're dropping things, which axis we're dropping. So remember, axis zero is um, here and axis one is across the top. So the columns are axis one. So let's do that. And then let's just print out df dropped columns. And we should just see name and age, which is what we expected to see there. Cool. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to import some data. So I've got some data over here. Let me just load this up. Um, so to, in Jupyter Notebook, you can basically just drag data across like that. So I've got this uh, data.csv. If I open this up, you can see that what I've done is I've gone onto my YouTube um, studio and I pulled a list down of all the different um, video IDs, the title of the videos, when they were published, how many views they've got as of today, the watch time in hours, subscriber count from that particular video, how many impressions they've had, what the impression click-through rate is. There's actually a lot more columns on here that it's not showing, uh, but that's a, a, a brief summary of what's in there. So what we can do in um, in Pandas, we can import that data. and It's ridiculously simple to do that. So let's go and Add a new code block. We can hide that column there just to make things a bit easier to read. And we're going to say, um, let's just do data frame equals, so pandas.readcsv. And then we just need to give the name of the CSV file that we are looking to open up. And then what we can then do is just print out um, our data frame. So there we go. It's read in all that data almost instantly. And then it's printed out the structure there. So it's even got the column headings 
because it's just taken the first row and assume that they're the, the uh, column headings. But there's a few things in this data set that we might want to clear up. So there are some streams there that have got like a single view. They've got um, there's no published time because it's it's hidden. It's uh, unlisted. And um, um, there's some other ones like the very top one is a total row. So you can see the total number of views just over a million views now, uh, one and a half million views now, sorry. On the channel but the rest of the columns it's not really relevant to what we need so there's some data cleansing that we can do on this uh, csv file using pandas so that's how we can import um, a csv file now we might want to convert this to be like a yaml file or an excel file and we can do those things very very simply uh, in pandas so let's take a look about how we will do that so what i will do now um, i'm going to export this first of all to be uh, a yaml file so I work a lot with YAML files when I'm building websites uh, such as kevsrobots.com. Uh, all the data is actually in YAML format. It's a bit easier to work with than CSV files um, as, a, as a human being. So what we will do is we'll say with open data.csv, uh, sorry, data.yaml. So this is going to be our new file. I'm going to write to this file. So we uh, uh, give it that and then we say as file and then we can say documents equals yaml dot dump and then we need to just uh, pass in some parameters so before we do that we actually need to import yaml and if you've not imported i'll just go over to visual studio and show you this if you've not imported yaml before you need to do pip install py yaml i think it does come installed with a lot of standard python installations but that's how you do it just in case you haven't done that already right let's go back over here uh, so we're going to dump out this uh, data from and we want to dump out into um, a node called result and then the actual data we want to dump out is the the data frame to dictionary and then we want to orient that to be records oops like so and then we want to close that to squiggly bracket there that looks right and then we want to pass in uh, the file and we want to say default flow style equals false and that's just how it structures the uh, the yaml file so if we run that now and what have i done wrong there so i've just not got my brackets quite correct there i think is it that that one after records that looks correct so orient records then file flow thingy my bob is false so where am i doing that wrong ah it's that one there okay so let's try that again okay and if i just refresh this folder here we've now got data.yaml so this is the same data that was in the csv file it's just represented in a different format so we can do this um, using some standard python and just using that yaml library um, okay, so that, that's because we're going to be doing some manipulations with some YAML in a minute uh, as well. So if we want to read that data back in from a YAML file, we can just do um, with open data.yaml. We can say that we're just reading that data in. Uh, again, we can say as file. And then we can just do YAML data equals YAML. And then dot safe load. And then just pass in file and then we can create a new data frame equals pandas dot data frame and then we can pass in that yaml data like so and if we print out our data frame at the end of that it should look the same as what we've been working with already now it doesn't quite look the same and that's because there's been an extra column added which is this uh, content so that's probably just something we need to rework um, in the i think it's that where we've added that results thing there we probably don't need to add that into the the yaml file if we look into that you'll see it says result at the top there i think if we actually get rid of that um or possibly change the uh the flow style that might also change that but um pack that for now uh, what we want to do is export some data to a csv so if we go back to our our nice CSV file that we imported to begin with. So that's over here. Let's just create a new code block underneath that. So if we want to export data, it's actually very, very simple to do this. So we would simply just do DF 
and then two CSV, and then we will pass in um, the name of the file that we want to export that to. So we could call this one, for example, new file dot csv let's run that and if we just refresh this folder here we've now got new file dot csv and that's the same as what we've been playing with before yeah that's because we we read in the data with the mix and just exported it back out to a csv file cool and if we want to export that to instead of a csv file we want to export that to a, an excel file we can do that by just doing df dot two and then Excel. And then again, we can just say new data dot XLSX, like so. Let's see if that's going to work. That's worked OK. Let's refresh that. And then we've got this new data dot XLSX, and that's just downloaded that as a, an Excel file. Cool. So we might want to uh, um, analyze our data next. We might want to look at missing data, um, filling the gaps and that kind of thing. So let's scroll down to where our next code block is going to be. And let's look at how we would identify some missing data. So let's do missing data equals, and then we can say df dot is null. Actually, it's just all one word. And then let's just print out missing data. What this is going to do is it's going to go through our entire data set and it's going to find if there is any records in there that have um, a null value so what i'm going to do i'm actually going to back up a little bit here because uh, when we read in that csv file which is here um, that's the order that we want our data that's what we want it to look like so what i want to make sure here is that that so let's just run that let's run okay run that run that I'm going to miss out the YAML one, and then I'm going to run our missing data one. There we go. So what it's doing here is it's looking in each cell, and it's saying whether there is data missing or not. So if we go to our, our um, CSV file, our original CSV file, let's look at it on the right-hand side. We can kind of see what's going on here. So video publish time on row zero and video title on row zero are both missing data. So they're true. So you can see there where it says true. And that's a way that we can very quickly find where the data is missing and then we can decide to do something with it such as drop it or maybe put a new value in there so we could actually fill in our missing data with specific values so let's look at doing that so let's go and say df oops df filled equals and we can say data frame fill na and then we can specify what the value is and we could just say, um, let's just give it the word empty cell, something like that. And then let's just print out our filled. And you can see that it's now filled those empty values with some text empty cell, for example, empty cell. But we could have that as zero or whatever we wanted it to be. So we could actually make that um, the value zero, for example, rerun that. And then we can now see that we've got the value zero in there instead of text. So it's very easy to change um, what missing data is in there and you can see how quickly it did that and there is actually I think 400 rows of data in here if we just um, we just change this and say what the shape of DF looks like uh, shape we'll actually see how many rows there are 451 so that's how quickly it's working through all this data um, okay so that's how we we fill up some missing data we can even interpolate some data so this might be useful when we're working with our salary thing. We're trying to figure out what salary to give somebody based on the value of other people's salaries, for example. Um, so let's find our, our salary stuff. What do we call that before? DF1. So let's just have a look at uh, DF1. Look at our shape for a second. So let's just see what we've got in there. Right, so I want to create a new value for Bob. Um, so let's say um, DF1 and let's just put in some interpolated data there so df1 and this is going to be location one i think that's how we do that and then that's going to be equal to uh, actually we want to, we want it to be this salary and let me just create a variable first of all so bob's new salary 
So let's do um, df one dot interpolate. There we go, interpolate. Let's see what happens there. Oh, so we've we've not given it we've not because I've been working with all the data that doesn't make sense to do that so let's just create um, df1 equals and let's just create some very simple values in here so I don't know one two three four five six whatever and then let's just try it with that oh no it's not happy with that because that needs to be a data frame so pandas dot data frame and then we can just pass in that list of things. I just want to see if I can get it to an answer. There we go. So it's interpolated some values um, in there. I don't think I'm demonstrating that one particularly well. I'll move on to the next one, which is dropping missing data. This is probably more useful. Right, so what we'll do is we'll create a new value called um, df dropped columns. And that's going to be df dot... Well, let's make sure we've got our data loaded correctly so I'm just going to do that one there df1 and then let's go back down to here so this I was just making sure because I'd overwritten the data there um, I just wanted to make sure we're working with the right, right data set and we can do that just by going back and rerunning the previous cell where we we did that and then we can basically just say drop na on axis 1 which is our columns so if we do that and then we print out um, our dropped columns Let's see what's in there. So these are the columns which are going to get dropped, I think. No, the other way around. If, if it has an NA in it, we are going to drop it. So because some of the columns had no data in them, some of the rows had no data in them, that's why they were candidates for being removed. And therefore, that's the, the set of data that we've now got. So all these columns are so the name, the content and impressions, and we can even drop that unnamed one because that looks like a replica of the, the index. And that's just because when we exported it, we exported it with the index. And we can actually say, don't do that as well, um, just by specifying an extra parameter in there. OK, so let's have a look. So we've looked at replacing data frames and we've looked at so we can filter some data. Let's have a look at this. Now that we've got a nice big data set, we can look at uh, doing some filtering on this. So let's say filtered data. And we can do, uh, let's do df, we're on df on this one, aren't we? Yes. And we can say, let's do views. Let's have a look at that. And I only want to, to see videos that got views over 10,000. So let's see that. And then give me that list back, filtered data. I will say just shape. How many records have we got with that? So 36 is what we've got. We can actually look at them if we uh, just run that with filtered data. So these are all the videos that have got over 10,000 views. And I can then dial that in and see how many with 20,000 views. So quite a few there. 11, I've got 20,000. Let's have a look how many have got 30,000. And we could do some like data analysis on this. Why is that? There's a particular subjects that people are interested in. So build your own AI assistant in Python. Control Arduino with Python. Build your own web server using a Raspberry Pi, Node Red automation with MicroPython, and there's a Raspberry Pi Pico Wi-Fi module, how to add Wi-Fi to it. So those videos have all performed very well from a um, per performance of how many views they've got, for example. So we can also summarize, we can get some um, statistical descriptions of our data. So we can do this just by, let's just create a new code cell. You notice when I run that, I can actually just press that button there just to get rid of the results. I can always just rerun it if I want to. But it just means it's nice and tidy when you're creating these. So if I do summary, and I can do df describe, and let's run this. What it will do is it will describe the summary. Let's just do that so we can see what's in the summary. And it basically just does a whole bunch of calculations. So it counts how many rows we've got, 451. What's the mean value of that? What's the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, and so on? 
and we can see um, for each of these columns the same calculation that's being done there so uh, if we want to see how many um, how many views we've had because it's including that row that says totals that's skewing it a little bit so we could actually drop that first column uh, that first row if we wanted to or exclude it cool so that is how we would um, do things like describe the, the data and some basic operations on there right what I want to do now let's give you a break for a second I'm just going to load up on my other screen uh, some github which has got my code in there that I want to type out and show you how this is going to work we're going to build out um, in fact let's go to github on here and show you what this looks like uh, so what's going on there da, da, da. so it's just a right so in github we have this idea of like a contribution chart so uh, is it on my profile that i see this there we go so this little thing here i love this it shows you how often you um you write code and check that code in uh, to github so you can see that uh, weekends i do a lot of coding and then through the week i'll do little bits here and there and just publish stuff um, and so on and you can see that for like each year how that looks different so i've not done a lot of coding this year and well done coding but not a lot on um, specific days so you can see there that particular day 42 contributions on 14th of november whenever that was what was that like a tuesday or something like that um, i was probably working on some problem and then just kept checking and checking in the code but i like the way this works so we've got in here we've got months of the year we've got days of the week and then we've got a color value which depends on how many contributions were made that specific day i want to build one of these but for youtube videos instead and i want to have that on kev's robots so if i go to kev's robots i've done something similar with like the robots and the projects so if i go on here you can see i built one there that says is my robot build calendar and pretty much every every month i'll have built at least one robot it's thinned out a little bit here um, probably because of the Rome Maker Fair and the Raspberry Pi 5 launch and so on. So we need to build a new robot. That's what this, this graph is telling me here. So that's what I've created. But I want to do this um, using NumPy and matplotlib as well. So what we will do, I'll just go over to GitHub on one computer. And I will basically just find my pandas um, demo. I think is it called pandas demo. I can't find it, but I need to find it. Uh, let's just find that on here. Repositories and then pandas. Let me just find what I've actually called this. So have I checked this in? Ah, not published it. So pandas demo. There we go. <laughs> publish the branch. And let's publish it as a public one. Why not? Okay. And let's just add to that DS store. This is an annoying file thing that uh, Apple always seems to add to files. I don't know why it does that, but um, we'll just add that in as well. And then we can get to the code, right? Okay. So let's hide that. And then let's go to our live. Ah, that's fine. Let's just ignore that. Okay. So let me just refresh that on my other screen. There we go. And let's load up the heat map. Where did I put my heat map? Where did I put that code? So I had all this ready to set up and then I've closed the thing down that I was actually working on. I think it's this one here. Yes, there it is. So that's called YouTube videos. And what did I actually call that library? So let me just go to that on GitHub. YouTube videos. Let's just find that on there. YouTube videos. Ugh. 
Right. Okay. What I will do is I will just have this off screen. Now let me just grab all this code. And let me just plunk this into a message. And then let me just hide this off the screen over here. Right. Okay. Okay. So let's go and do a new, a new file. Right. Okay. We're ready to rock. Okay. Here we go. So first of all, what I want to do, uh, let me just grab that file that I just had, I've just created. So I'm just trying to find the, uh, the file I've literally just created, and there it is. Right, so I just make that larger so I can see it, and then I can start coding this and explain it as we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to use something called Seaborn for doing heat maps. So if I do import Seaborn, as SNS, that's the usual way of doing this. Uh, let's see if we've got a virtual environment. Let's go into that virtual environment, um, binary and activate. And let's make sure we've got Seaborn installed. Yep, it's already installed. Good, good, good. We're going to now use pandas and numpy. So import pandas as pd. We've got import uh, matplotlib as plt. That's the the usual way of doing this, the pi plot part of that. We're also going to import numpy as np. Uh, we're going to import calendar because we're going to do some stuff with calendars. We're going to import um, date time because we're going to be dates. And we're also going to create some colors, some um, colors that we want to use in our heat map. We're not just going to go with the basic ones. So the first thing we want to do is we want to pull in some data. So I'm going to pull in that very same um, data that we looked at a second ago. So PD read CSV table data. Make sure I've got table data there. Yes, we have. We can have a look at that as well if we want. There you go. Looks like the usual thing we've just been working with. And let's just maximize that screen there and then just move that down a little bit. Okay. Um, then we're going to convert one of the columns in this so that that column that is the the published time I actually want that to be a proper python date um, so let's do that we're going to convert this published time to be a date time so the way that we do that is we say data and this is the data frame that we're working in video publish time equals pandas dot to date time and then we pass in the column that we want to convert there so if we were to look at date, data now, we would actually see that um, if we print out data, uh, run this, let's see what it looks like. And let's just move this up a bit. We can see now that we've got some, um, the columns in there, but actually it's the, it's the uh, video publish time column that we actually want to see. So if I just do that, um, you can see some of these are dates and then if it says NAT, not a time, so it's not a date time uh, in there. So this is for some of them that haven't been published and therefore they haven't got a date time stamp in there, but we can filter that out uh, in a minute. So that's just to show you how that works. Um, so next we want to extract the week of the year and the day of the year, or the, the day of the week from each of these. So we'll do data and then week. Uh, oops. And that's going to equal the data video publish time. And then this DT is this date time um, dot ISO calendar. And then we want the week of that particular date. So it'll give us that. And then we want to do the same with the, the day of the week um, by saying the from the data frame, find the video published uh, column, publish time column, look at the date time and give me the name of the day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that kind of thing. Next up, we want to filter the current year. So we will say current year equals date time now. Uh, that will give us 2023, which is when we are creating this video. And we also want to um, grab that and filter it. So we say the data now becomes equal to what was in the data frame. And then the video published time is going to be equal to the current year. So it'll filter out everything else. So we would now print out data. Let's do data shape and see what that looks like. Let's just run this. We should have a lot less. We've got now 81 columns rather than 451. Um, so that's useful. And that will also have got rid of that annoying total one and anything that hadn't got a published date in it too. So anything that's just in that data is now um, in the current year. Okay. So next up, what we want to do is we want to 
um, group by week and date of the year and then count the videos. So let's do this. So because I've got this open in another window, it knows um, Google, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code uh, Copilot is helping by reading what's already been typed out in another window, basically just pre-populating these things for me. So I just need to make sure that that works right. So the grouped data equals to the data frame. And we're going to group by week and day of week, which are the new two columns that we added to our data frame uh, earlier up just here. And then we're going to say reset the index and then um, give it the name video count. So if we now look at, let's print out grouped data and see what this looks like. Let's just run that. Yeah, you can see now we've got this uh, extra column, um, extra columns week and day of week, and then how many videos we have in those particular ones. Um, okay, so what we want to do next then is we want to pivot our data. So let's do um, pivot and get this matrix format. So we're going to say heat map data equals group data dot pivot. Index equals day of the week, the columns equal week, the values equal the week, the values equal the video count, and then we want to fill anything that hasn't got data with a zero. So fill the not applicables with zero. So if we now look at our uh, heat map data, look at what this looks like. It'll start to look like a little bit what we want, but this is currently like a table, it's not a graph just yet. So we've got the day of the week and we've got values in there which are kind of floating point numbers we want to change them to be uh, a color value when we actually make this into a, a graphic but you can see how this is sort of coming together now uh, so next we want to sort the days of the week so let's do uh, oops i just press the wrong button then what's happening there cancel uh, so we want to um, sort by the days of the week so days of the week order is monday through to sunday that's the order that i want it to be in and then we basically just say the heat map data um, re-indexed by the day order that we've just created there so if we now just look at that um, heat map data and just run that again it'll now go from monday through to sunday so you can see that day of week monday through to sunday which is what we want and each of these individual columns in here is the weeks of the year okay so let's now create a complete index for all our weeks of the year um, so let's do that create a complete index of, of all the weeks of the current year and uh, we can do that by just saying um, pa um, pandas.series and then create one that was, that's the range from 1 to 53 and store that in a, an array that's just called all weeks so if we do that, we can then add to our existing one, we can re-index it um, to include all weeks. Because what if we if we didn't do this, what we would find is at the very end of our uh, graph, it would basically go up to the last time I checked in uh, a video into YouTube, and nothing for the rest of the year, so it wouldn't have those extra weeks. So by adding these all weeks, it means we can see the future weeks where we haven't published videos yet, but it make, makes our graph look complete. So that's what we're doing there. So to do this, we just need to say heat map data is re-index columns equals all weeks and the fill values are zero. So it's just going to add those extra missing bits of data to um, our file. Okay, or to our uh, data frame. Now, next up, I want to define some specific RGB values uh, for our um, our GitHub-like contribution thing now these are some values i've found um, previously so these are red green and blue values so ignore the divide by 255 We're essentially this is the value the red the green and blue value so light gray is very light <laughs> as you'd expect and then we've got some green values and i've just re replicated a few there uh, just to make it look the way i want it to to look and what we need to do next with these is we need to pass these to a custom um, color map so this is part of this uh, linear segmented color map, I think is part of um, matplotlib. And a linear segmented color map is kind of as you would expect. We have different gradations of colors in that color map based on these RGB values that we've passed in just here. And I'm going to use that color map when we actually draw out our, um, our um, graph in a second. So now we've done that, we want to set the size of the heat map. So this is going to be 12 by 6. 
and then we want to create the heat map without any annotations in there. So what this is going to do is it's just going to change the axis. We've got that SNS, which is our uh, Seaborn uh, heat map generating library. We're going to pass in that heat map data. We're going to pass in the color map that we've created. The line style is going to be um, like half a, 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 a unit. The line color is going to be white. We're not going to have any uh, um, legends on, on the graph and we're going to set the type of cell to be square. So the aspect ratio will be square. So that's what's going to happen there. Uh, next up, we are going to um, annotate the the uh, month names. So we want to put in the month names in here. So we just need to do 1 to 13. We want to say the month start is the current year, current month 1, so January. And then we want to add to our plot, which is this PLT, uh, the text, uh, which is the month start, minus 1, the date, um, which is the current year, month, uh, from January and then the string from time so this will just put in the month which is what that percentage B means there and we want it to be sort of centered um, on that that um, in the plot for each of the cells so that's actually going to draw it out um, we don't actually want a title on here so I'm just going to leave that blank but we do want to blank out some of the labels what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get it to draw this for you now so you can see so far what this looks like so if I just do plot.show it's also tell me if I've got any errors to date that's what it's looking like so far so we're pretty close to what we want so we've got the the months across the top we've got the the colors where we've actually checked in you can see there where it says Monday that's usually because it takes um, so many hours from when I do the live show it takes over five hours for it to actually publish it so Monday morning we usually get those videos sort of popping through there I'm interested that there's a bit of a problem there because that the October Thursday or Wednesday whenever it is that's when we had the Raspberry Pi 5 launch I think and there was lots of activity around that so that's actually like a super check-in because there was lots of videos launched on that day um, so some, some things I'm not happy with is this day of the week we can see that the days of the week we don't need to see that and we also don't need to see the number of the week we don't need to see that either so what we're going to do is we're going to correct those just by blanking those out so if I go back up here and just change this axis so axis dot set the x ticks um, ticks to be basically nothing ticks to be nothing I'm gonna mess up that there we go and let's do the uh, let's do the labels as well so set labels to be equal to nothing and let's do so that should be the X label and we need to do the same for the Y label. It's label, not labels. And we just need to set that to be nothing like so. And let's just run that and see what that looks like. I think we're nearly there now with this. So that looks pretty good to me. I'm actually quite happy with that. So we just want to save this out to a file. This is basically just showing it um, using um, uh, the built-in, what's the name of the thing? Is it tkinter? tkinter? Uh, but yeah, we want to save this out. So the way that we do this, we do plot.save fig, because these are figures, we'll call it heat map. We can say how many dots bridge it is, and we can say, um, what the bounding box is around it so there we go we can save that out and then let's just run that so it should show it again which is what we've got there but we should now have a new file which is heatmap.png and there it is so we created using some pandas to manipulate our data by putting it into a data frame we've been able to create a really cool graphic and i can now use that graphic on my website whenever i publish a new video so I'll show you typically what I need to do um, every week. So I'll go into my kezrobots.com. Um, I will find my data. I'll go down to my youtube.yaml. And we can see here, these are all the videos that I publish. So I basically just copy and paste the, the date that it was published, the title of the video, and then the video ID. I also say whether it's like a live stream or um, a video, I think there's some shorts in there as well, just so that I can I can use that to filter data if I want to. 
And that YAML file gets um, used when it's building um, the kevsrobots.com website. So if I go to videos up here, I can, lick, I can click on list of shows and it will show you a list of all the videos I've ever made from that YAML file. So you can see that it's got the, the title of the video with a link to it. It's got the date that it was published and the type of live stream that it was. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to create this pandas Python file is this popular column here is just something I arbitrarily put in there manually by going through the videos one at a time and seeing has this got so many views. I can now automate that. So that's quite cool. So that's everything I wanted to show you on um, uh, the hands-on part of the video. So if you like what I do and you want to make the, more of these kinds of videos, please give this video a like. Drop me a comment. Let me know if you've heard of pandas before, if it's something that you'll be using in your workflow. Is it something you could use at work, for example? And if you're not subscribed to the video channel, please subscribe to the channel. It means a lot to me personally, and it helps me grow the channel even more. I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock um, GMT. We're now out of um, summer daylight savings time, so it's no longer BST. It's now GMT. <coughs> and we do have a brand new course that's available on pandas so i've launched that today if you go to kevsrobots.com slash learn slash you'll see that there is now a new pandas course that you can take that covers everything that we've been through today and you can sort of read through that in slow time there's no sign up required or anything like that you can jump straight into the course and start learning today so go to kevsrobots.com slash learn forward slash to get started with that and we do have merch. We have uh, these really nice robot maker hats come in a variety of different colours. I think I need to get a few more of these, maybe some uh, different colours, just to switch it up a bit. We have the mugs and we also have the uh, the hoodies and t-shirts as well. Uh, so go over to kevsrobots.com slash merch to find those. And you can also join our Discord server. So we are on, uh, if you go to kevsrobots.com slash Discord, you shall find a sign up link there. Just ask you for your email address for our newsletter and uh, you can just jump straight in to our really vibrant community of people on there. You can also follow me on social media. So I'm on all the social medias. So I'm on uh, threads at kevinmacalea at threads.net. I'm on TikTok at kevinmacalea6. I'm on Instagram at uh, kevinmacalea. I'm on X as kevsmac. I'm on Mastodon Social at kevsmac, Mastodon Social. And I'm also on Blue Sky at kevsmac.bluesky.social as well. So follow me on there if you want some behind the scenes pictures and so on, and just to say hi. And uh, your support really matters to me. Uh, so if you want your name in the end credits, you can go over to kevsrobots.com slash coffee and buy a coffee. And that will, um, I do like physical coffee. We had some nice Romanian coffee when uh, Alex and Jen went to Transylvania um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and you can also do a couple of other things. You can do a super thanks. So let me just bring up a super thanks to make sure that's now switched on. So I just need to go and press a button on here. There we go. Um, and you can basically just type, um, you can click on the thanks button underneath the main YouTube video player. If you're in the live chat, you can do a super chat. I think there's a button for that. It's that little dollar button there and uh, you can buy a coffee that way. Or if you want to join the, the YouTube membership program, you can click on the join button, which after you've subscribed, I think it gets replaced by a join button. And again, it's for the price of a coffee per month. You can help support the show. So let's, uh, excuse me. Let's have a look at some of those people who've done exactly that. So I've actually not had many coffees recently. So the past month, no one's bought me a coffee. <laughs> Rattle, rattle. Uh, but we do have some members from our Buy Me A Coffee membership. So um, we have uh, Marie Louise Mayer, who's on the chat today. We have Jeff Johnson. We've got Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, Tom Shemi, and Steve Phillips. Hey, Steve. We have some YouTube members as well. We've got Alistair Wave, who, uh, sorry, Alistair Ware, I beg your pardon, who joined last week. We've got John Paul Jolly. We've got Chris. We've got Cassie. Hi, Cassie. We've got Dale um, from Hybrid Robotics. We've got Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates. We have Bill Hoy, uh, Oxrad39, Hands from Cheerlights, and we have uh, Michael and, of course, Tom. So thank you all for supporting the show. So you can get your name in the credits here just by going to kesrobots.com slash credits or slash coffee, whichever you prefer. Cool. So let me have a look what else there is to cover off. I think that is everything for the main show. So let me just... Uh, Go back over to there. Yes, it looks like that's the that's the wrap up slide. <laughs> so it's at this point in the video. I'll say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time.